Assalamu alaikum and welcome to part 4 of the Magic Evil Eye and Envy talk. If there is a story in the book of Allah, in the Quran, that has been covered from all angles and has been intensified for us to understand it, is the story of Musa with Fir'aun and with Musa and the children of Israel. So much so that our books of tafsir, our sheikhs, our scholars in the Sunni sphere said the Quran almost became a book of Musa versus Fir'aun and Musa with the children of Israel. As a matter of fact, the name of Musa has been mentioned in Al-Quran far more than that of Muhammad. Muhammad's name was, I think, four times. Musa's name over 90 times. And that is really, tell, it tells us something about uh, what happened there. But anyhow, let's go back to the story of Musa versus the magicians. Because Allah, as I said, has covered this story from all angles, especially that of the magicians with Musa. فَإِذَا حِبَالُهُمْ وَعَصِيُّهُمْ يُخَيَّلُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ سِحْرِهِمْ أَنَّهَا تَسْعَى And suddenly their ropes and staffs seemed to Musa, to him, from their magic, from the act they put, that they were moving like snakes. Musa has been trained and trained very well in the art of seeing a staff, a piece of dead wood that a human can carry in their hand, become a full-blown snake and alive flesh and meat and blood and bones and spine and everything that a snake has. And that didn't happen only once, it happened a few times. Allah has said this about that stuff. One time it moved like a very agile snake. Another time it moved extremely fast. And another time, but anyhow. So Musa was already well trained and he knows when he throws the stuff for the purpose of it becoming a snake, it shall turn into a snake. And then he would just stretch his hand to pick up that snake and the moment his hand touched whatever part of the snake, it turned into a staff. <laughs> it's, this is like a cane, it's impossible for us, but that's what happened. So Musa, who is well trained and spoke to Allah and he sees of the miracles of Allah, when he saw what the magicians had conjured up and what they have put out, فَأَوْجَسَ فِي نَفْسِهِ خِيفَةً Musa got extremely fearful within him. That's a fear inside him. If Musa had turned away to run away from what the magicians have done, then Musa would have lost, Fir'aun would have won, and Allah himself would have lost. Since Allah doesn't enter in direct competition with the humans, those who represent Allah who are the messengers and the messengers only. No scholar and no human can say something on behalf of Allah. All we say is this, Allah said in the Quran and this is how we understand it. That's where it ends. No one can talk on behalf or in the name of Allah except messengers. So Musa got scared and if he ran away it would have meant the end of everything that Musa stood for and everything that the children of Israel stood for. At that moment Allah calls upon him, Musa, we said, قُلْنَا لَا تَخَفْ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْأَعْلَى Do not be afraid, don't get scared, you are the one that shall have the upper hand i.e. you're gonna be victorious of this. And that was how Allah calmed down the nerves of Musa, how Allah cut off the fear of Musa. And then Allah, because Musa was completely distracted by what they did, so Allah brought back his attention to what he should be done. And he said, وَأَلْقِ مَا فِي يمينك. And Musa was a right-handed man. So Allah commands him, and throw what is in your right hand. And it shall devour what they have invented. The act of devouring something is really simple. Take a lion, starve him for a week until he sees everything. A piece of rock to him means a piece of meat. 
and then throw a piece of meat in the cage and watch how the lion devours that piece of meat. He's gonna eat it like there is no tomorrow. He's gonna be extremely, there is a lot of power in the act of eating. And that exactly what Musa, the moment he threw away his stuff, and the stuff straight away started devouring everything. These hundreds or thousands, depending on who said how the number of them is, and it started devouring. You would think that the snake would get filled, right? But it didn't. It swallows an entire stick or a rope and moves on to the other one and to the other one. All this under the supervision of Pharaoh is seeing that. The people of Egypt are seeing that. The magicians, and the great number of them, those most experienced and knowledgeable magicians, see that. And above all, Musa was saying that. He was seeing that because Allah had told him, throw your stuff it will devour what they have done for the only son of Seher. What they have invented is nothing but a trick of a magician. Put a thousand lines under the word trick. It's only a trick. And then Allah speaks about the magicians, not their tricks, about the magicians themselves. And the magician shall never ever succeed wherever he she goes in other words a magician can pull the most astutious the most intelligent the most incredible trick in front of your very eyes but they can never ever create something out of nothing that is only a gift that Allah, uh, it's not a gift, but that's only what Allah can do. And that is the truth that we should. No magician, it's not those magicians of, of Musa only, it's the magician. And that's why Allah said, لا يفلح الساحر, i.e. the magician. Capital T, capital M, would never ever succeed in producing something out of nothing. The magicians, when they saw this, and when they saw what Musa, his stuff, and it turned into a real snake, they realized that Musa is not a magician. Because this kind of magic doesn't exist, never has and never will. And at that moment there, they straight away realized that Musa is actually truly a messenger of God, because only God can turn a piece of wood into a living snake. And from what I just mentioned in the Quran here, we can take the following. Magicians succeed by inventing new tricks. Go on the internet today, buy, buy those uh, boxes that teach kids magic. I've bought one to my daughter from Penn and Teller, and she really loved it. Why? Because it taught her some tricks on how to do them. So tricks, yes, but the outcome of that trick is only a trick. Magicians act on what people see. And this has been accomplished by the magicians of Musa. And they played on the eyes of the people. And the magicians that you see them in front of you, if you go to Vegas, or if you see them on the streets of your city, or if you see them through the internet on YouTube, all of these people, they only put an act for your eyes. They take something, they turn it into something else, and you don't know how they did it. But you can be extremely sure that there is a trick in between that, the agility of their deed, and the sleight of hand generated that trick. We also get that the magicians can never ever create anything new from nothing, be that physical or spiritual. I'm going to play the magician right now with you, yeah? Let's, let's do this experiment. Please, if you are washing your dishes, if you are driving, or if you are, just give me your uh, concentration for a second. Yeah, just a second. We're going to work on this. I want you now to imagine the brain of yours is just somewhere. You pick where that somewhere is. It's not important. And then I want you to look at your hand, the right hand. And now, just let your mind free. In that hand, you are carrying a lemon. You split the lemon into two. And you are bringing it to your mouth. And suddenly you feel a taste in your mouth. Okay, stop, come up. You see what I mean? You see what I did there? Haven't you felt in your mouth the saliva anticipating a piece of lemon? 
That's magic. Because what I did is simple. It's a trick. I triggered your mind with to think of a picture that it already has, an experience that it had before. And I just linked it now with that picture and I used my voice, my tricky, and you start salivating over it. And that's incredible what the brain can do. And that is why magicians never ever can they succeed at performing for example why don't they make money at home why do you pay them to see them pull a trick under your eyes why Pharaoh had to pay why did they ask Pharaoh should they are they gonna is he gonna pay them and he said of course I'm gonna not only pay you but I'm gonna give you high status you're gonna have new position social position in the community where you live a magician who can allegedly create something doesn't need all that kind of stuff magicians are the same all over history and all over the world because anyone who acts in the name of magic shall never ever produce the magic they seek uh, and I mean the one where the gin and they make you fool or they make you lose your business and things like that all right so you're a good business person or someone puts a, sp a spell on you and the next day you don't know how to calculate you make f uh, fatal errors and then suddenly the business collapses it doesn't happen like that and the last thing that we get from that is magicians act on the fear of people the more scared the person is the more successful a magician is and that is how it is. And now I'm going to take you to, we're going to leave the story of Musa and the magicians. We'll get back to it a little bit later. But for now, let's see what the Prophet Muhammad, Muhammad and his people in Mecca. And to understand why people always react negatively towards the messengers of Allah. Why do people go to the extreme of fighting the messengers of Allah? It's simple. It boils down to one thing and one thing only. The human nature. You see, humans always get defensive towards whatever challenges or beliefs, new beliefs or customs that come to them that they don't understand or they don't like and that's how they get defensive. And oftentimes when, you, when Allah sends a messenger to a people, it always is to correct something in the way these people relate to Allah. And oftentimes these people, they add external entities and give meanings to certain things and, and, and powers that only Allah has, they give them to some other people. This is very clear, for example, in the history of the Greek civilization or the Roman civilizations. They have a God for almost everything. Greeks of before, if you ever go to Greek, you'll still see the heads of their gods carved in uh, marbles and all these things. And you go, really? And they go, yes. Zeus, who is recognized as the father of gods and humans. But this Zeus, he has his statue in Greece, in Athens, and he's there in his head. Sometimes he's on the ground. You get Demeter, who is the, he's the goddess, or she's the goddess of agriculture. She protects the trees and plants and grains. Poseidon is the guy or the god that, that deals with the oceans. He's a brother of Zeus, they said. But he was responsible over the kingdom of the sea. And is also considered to be the god of horses and earthquakes. Apollo. Apollo, this guy, he, they say he's the child of Zeus. And they say he is the god of light, music and poetry, healing and prophecy. And that's why you go to so many theaters around the world and you find them, that one of them is named like the biggest one here in London, it's called Apollo. Athena, or Athena, was the beloved daughter of Zeus and she also was the goddess of wisdom and strategic warfare. And all these kinds of... Needs, there are hundreds if not thousands of these gods and that is exactly what has rubbed on the Arabs. The Arabs followed in the pathway of the Greek and the Romans where they assigned to each phenomena that they didn't understand or they don't know of a god. God of rain, God of wind, God of earth, God of fire, God of trees, God of animals, God, 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 God. And when Allah sent Muhammad as a messenger to just give them one element that all the goddesses that they have, they actually aren't gods because there is only one and one single god.
and the resemblance you have stricken with the Greek civilization is so so wrong and that is why when Allah sent Muhammad to them they were mesmerized they were astonished and they amazed that a warner has come to them from them and the kuffar and the disbelievers said he's a magician a real liar has he reduced all the gods to just one god this indeed is something astonishingly shocking وَانْطَلَقَ الْمَلَأُ مِنْهُمْ أَنِمْشُوا And the leaders of them, of the um, people of Mecca, parted away and they were talking to each other and said, let's go, walk away. And they say to each other, and be patient against for what is being said now about your gods. This indeed is something that has been planned. We never have heard this. We never heard of such a thing in the generations that have gone past. Such is nothing but a fabrication. And you can read more about this in Surah 38 from Ayah 4 to 7. So as you can see, the people of Mecca had a big problem. And they kept rejecting the Quran and the messengership of Muhammad because of the, one of the most dangerous accusations is that Muhammad is just a magician that wants to pull a trick in front of the very eyes. Why? Because you cannot turn so many gods into one god. None of our predecessors have said the, such a thing. The scenario of Muhammad being a magician was always played by the people of Mecca because they truly believed that Muhammad was a magician and they actually were scared that he could be a high sorcerer. How? When he reads to them Al-Quran in a manner they are not used to listen and hear and because the Quran is so captivating, so powerful, the more you know of the Arabic, the more it captivates you. And they were scared that as soon as they listen to the Quran, something gets to them and it creates something in them that was not done before. So because it's not there before, they, that's what they considered to be magic. And that's the reason why they attacked the Quran as being the book of magic. Was this just for the people of Mecca? Absolutely not. This is a trade of the human race. Anytime somebody brings a book from Allah and because of the power of that book, be that the Torah, the gospel, what was revealed to Abraham or David, David or any other messenger before them, Nuh, Salah, Hud and all these people, the moment they start reading the word of Allah, the humans, when they listen to them, they get captivated by it. It captures away their intention, their hearts and everything. And that's what they think is magic. Allah says about this reality equally to the what people of Mecca are saying no messenger ever came to those to his people before them except that they would say that he is either a magician or a crazy sorcerer that's it it's either madman or a magician and this accusation formula has lived and really has stayed powerful throughout time and history. And this is why Rasulullah kept answering back, I am neither a magician nor crazy, but just a messenger from Allah to you to deliver his message to you. People today, my dear sisters and my brothers, do take the same stand as the other people of before. The general public don't buy much into new ideas. Subhanallah, I read to them the Quran and I can see in their eyes, it's almost like I'm playing a trick of magic. They look at me with big eyes as if they have seen a ghost. When I finish the Quran, I'll tell them it's clear. But their mind refuses to take the Quran in. And this is really scary and disturbing at the same time. And this is why from Nuh all the way to Moses, to, through Jesus to Muhammad, the message was the same. That message was the way it was then and is today and shall remain until judgment day.
ولا إن قلت إنكم مبعوثون من بعد الموت and if you were to tell them يا محمد or يا موسى or يا عيسى or يا نوح or anybody or me today or others to the people who don't believe you all will be resurrected after death لا يقولن الذين كفروا إن هذا إلا سحر مبين the disbelievers shall certainly answer this is nothing but pure and evident magic now ask yourself this question why do they say this why would somebody that you tell him you're gonna get resurrected on judgment day they would tell you you are a magician this is just a sorcery well it's simple because humans draw this knowledge that magicians they have hidden powers they talk to the dark side and the dark side can revive the dead it has access to the dead people to that realm and it can do things that you and me can't understand but it's there and that's why judgment day to day uh, to them is nothing else but an act of magic and this is not true other people they threw away and they say it's just a matter of we die and we live and then we get resurrected and they say it and Allah has answered them in the Quran وَقَالُوا مَا هِيَ إِلَّا حَيَاتُنَا الدُّنْيَا and they said this is just our worldly life we live and we die and nothing destroys us except time and you go today in certain religion in the world certain religions in the world around the world they tell you the power of resurrection if you're good in this life you resurrect good in the other one or maybe vice versa and if you are evil in this life and you resurrect in your second life as evil then in the third one you get annihilated no more chances of life really then Allah answers them and he says وَمَا لَهُمْ بِذَلِكَ مِنْ عِلْمٍ إِنْهُمْ إِلَّا يَظُنُونَ and indeed they have no knowledge to, to claim that they only assume it and this is extremely dangerous because the state of the Arabs wasn't that different to how people are today we hear people believing in reincarnation or that they won't be resurrected hey you re to the Arabs you read the Quran and it doesn't register to the rest of the world you tell them hey and they go you know what this is your life live it to the maximum why do they say that because they know they will not there will not be another life in the hereafter no one who believes in the hereafter will tell you live your life to the maximum you don't go to a priest in the church you will never ever hear a rabbi or a priest or a sheikh or an imam or any of the leaders in religion telling you you know what live your life to the maximum because what it also means is once you're dead you're dead and anyone who tells you this is somebody who at the far bottom of their heart aren't working for the here after I'm not saying anything about what their fate will be because later on they might uh, repent to Allah or they might do other things but I'm saying for the state of how things are now let's go back to about 15 centuries ago because this problem has been enduring and when you go back uh, to the times where it took place where well, the magicians of Musa met uh, with Musa and the Fir'aun and all these things the challenge was clear that whenever Allah sends a messenger with signs with miracles as we call them those miracles are always there to scare people Miracles that Allah sends are never to entertain people. Musa in his first encounter with Firaun had two miracles. One of them is his hand. He stretched it, you see his hand. Then he put it under his armpit. And then he brings it out and it changes. Now, in our books of tafsir and in our books of sheikhs and things like that, they say Musa was a dark featured man. He almost was a black person. He was very dark. He's not white. And when he put his arm, when he put his armpit under uh, his hand under his armpit and pulls it out again, it comes out white, completely white. So you have here a human who is dark, very dark skin, and then he just puts his hand under his armpit and it comes all white. Now. How is this going to scare people that you put your hand, uh, the black hand, and it comes out white? It doesn't scare people. If I were the Pharaoh, I get amused by it. I would say, Musa, why don't you do your face? Hey, do, 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 do your neck. Oh, come on, do the right cheek. Come on, come on, let me see how it gets white. But no, Pharaoh was petrified when he saw the hand. 
And you know why? Simple. Fir'aun had claimed he is a god. Then Allah is going to teach him that he is not a god. And Allah in the first challenge or in the first um, uh, time that he met with Musa, Allah's messenger, Allah gave to Musa the two opposites that Fir'aun cannot do. And that's why Musa, Fir'aun believed that Musa was playing magic and he was pulling an act of magic before his very eyes because Fir'aun had already seen how magicians performed before. So he tells Musa, Musa gets into the Pharaoh, seeks a place in the court to talk to Pharaoh. The moment he gets there, Pharaoh with everybody, the castle, as I said, the, the, the people, the army, the ministers, everybody is there, the priests and everything. And Musa straight away throws the stuff on the, on, on the floor and it turns into a real snake. And you can hear people, oh, wow, a piece of wood, a dead piece of wood suddenly became an alive animal wow so people got mesmerized they were shocked by this then when that act was finished musa now goes to the second part of his deed and this one really made pharaoh think that musa was a true magician musa would stretch his hand pharaoh looks at the hand and then musa takes his hand puts it under his armpit and then when he pulls it to Pharaoh, he pulls it a dead corpse. His hand is completely dead. It's just the hand that is dead. The rest of the body is alive. I want you to just think of your hand, completely dead, the skeleton and maybe some, you know, when dead people are. And then he would take that dead hand and puts it under his armpit, press, bring out, a normal hand more time when he puts his hand under his armpit it comes out completely dead wouldn't that scare you it would petrify me if someone can do that oh my god what can he do no human can create something of out nothing but Allah and that is why Allah created a dead corpse out of a hand and that dead corpse of the hand was living in a live body. Musa was alive. And the opposite of that, he took a piece of wood that was dead and he turned it into a living animal. When Fir'aun saw that and everybody around him said that, instead of believing in Allah as the magicians did, what did they do? Straight away the Fir'aun said, أَجِئْتَنَا لِتُخْرِجَنَا مِنْ أَرْضِنَا بِسِحْرِكَ يَا مُوسَى He said, have you come to drive us out of our land with your magic, O oh Moses? We can surely bring you similar act of magic as yours. So why not set for us an appointment that neither any of us will fail to keep? And choose a well-placed ground, dear Musa. Musa responded, your appointment is on the day of celebration. There was an upcoming celebration and Musa decided that day when they have a party, street party, that is the day when the challenge shall take place. And then Musa added something extremely important and he said, let the people be gathered in the midday when the sun is in the middle of the sky. This way, Musa ensured that the magicians will not use darkness or the twilight or any other conditions to their advantage. And then Pharaoh went away and started getting his plot together. And then he came around for the meeting to meet with Musa and everyone. And it is at that moment that Musa turned to the magicians as they were standing face to face, ready to throw their plot and show what they got. He tells them, woe to you, be warned, do not fabricate a lie against Allah, or he will wipe you out with a severe punishment. And whoever fabricates a lie that is magic, is bound to fail. This is why magicians can never ever uh, succeed. No one can put a spell against you and the spell works. 
If that was the case, I would love our magicians at the World Cup together. Senegal, come on, Senegal. Come on, the magicians, be smart. And then it no longer is a World Cup in football. It will be a World Cup of the magicians behind the scene, football in France. And then the World Cup will never ever leave the African countries, the Muslim countries and the backward countries, because they'll be strong in magic. Come on, why doesn't the voodoo work in World Cup? Why magic doesn't work in, for example, in uh, the MotoGP, the, 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 the bike racing uh, sports, or car racing, or any other competition? Why does it only work in backward countries where there is ignorance and when someone wants to put a spell so that he gets married from that girl or she wants to separate the, that couple and the end of it? You see what I mean? Magic has always been a lie. And it always has been a lie against Allah. Because the magicians claim to create something out of nothing. While such a deed is only for Allah to do. No one can do that. The magicians, when Musa spoke to them, what did they do? They disputed amongst themselves. And then they came up with a plot and they hid it and they hid it very well with themselves. They were scared of Musa. Maybe Musa will hear about what we're going to do and then he's going to counteract. So they hid everything there. And they said to each other, those magicians, speaking about Musa and his brother Harun, they said, you know what, these two are just magicians. They are just sorcerers like us. And all they want is to drive you, the magicians, out of business from where you operate in the land of Egypt. And they will take away your perfect example of conducting your business i.e. the magic practices and how you are duping people and lying to them and making a living on their thing. If Harun and Musa succeed, then that's it. They've taken the business away. So they agreed amongst themselves. So come up with a firm plot and stand together in one side, in one row against these Musa. And then they said, and whoever wins today in this challenge, in this day of celebration, shall have the upper hand in Egypt and we'll stand tall in front of everybody. They said, yeah, Musa, either you throw or we throw. And that's when he said to them, no, you throw. And then they started conjuring up. They started throwing their ropes and the sticks they have and everything. And they put the spell in front of people. And all they could do is play the trick on the eyes of people, just like a magician in Vegas with a card game or any other game plays a trick right in front of your eyes and you look at the trick, you see things happening, you know they are not real, but they seem real and you cannot express or explain them, but guess what? It entertains you. But the kind of magic that these magicians put had driven a man that was trained by Allah, real life, Musa. Musa threw this stuff. Always remember, you threw something, it becomes a snake, you pick it up, it becomes your cane. Musa was trained in that. And even with that, the trick of the magicians played on him. And he got very, very scared. And it was an internal fear because he didn't scream or something. And had Allah not fortified the heart of Musa by calling him, Musa, do not be scared, you are the one with the upper hand and throw what you have in your right hand, it shall devour what they have created, for what they created is nothing else but a craft of a magician, it's just a trick, and the sorcerer, wherever he be, or place or time, shall never ever succeed. And so the question is, why do Muslims believe, since I'm talking to Muslims here, but why do Muslims believe that someone can put a spell on you and ruin your life? Why do we believe that someone can put a spell on you and your wife can only get girls? And this kind of stupid, idiotic beliefs. But the magicians of Musa, those who knew and who understood magic as they ought to, the moment they saw what Musa did, 
Straight away they fell in prostrations. They yielded to Musa. They recognized that what he did is not magic. And that's the reason why the first thing they did after they yielded physically, because they were thrown on the ground and prostrated, they put their head on the ground. And as soon as they stood up, they said, we believe in the Lord of Harun and Musa. Elsewhere in the Quran, we hear them say, we believe in the Lord of Musa and Harun. And of course, it's a probability of 50-50. It's either Harun or Musa or Musa and Harun. And that came and that shows you how much the Quran pays attention to details. Fir'aun got extremely mad at that. And he tells them, you believed in him before I authorized you? He certainly is your senior magicians who taught you magic. And that's why you yielded to him without my authorization. And Fir'aun took the fight to a new level that the magicians that he brought paid. And he hosted in his castle and gave them the best treatment. He straight away accused them of being accomplices to Musa. Of course, the magicians weren't, and they knew what Musa had put is not an act of magic. And that is when they said to him, you know what? Do whatever you do, we believe in Allah. And of course, the story of the Quran goes on when they said to Musa, uh, to Fir'aun, a lot of things that Allah has revealed in the Quran. So the thing that I want to get here through this story is that magic does not exist. Even if our sheikhs, they say it is, uh, as a Nawawi, and as I said, and uh, Ibn Qudam, and everybody, and all the scholars of Islam, they say they exist. The reason why they say it exists, because if they say it does not exist, they will lose a lot. They will lose the argument that the messenger of Allah was insulted. And if that happens, it means that the books that reported this lie are liars. And if they say Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, and the other ones have lied, guess what? We're going to ask them what else did they lie on? And the issue will carry on and carry on. And without you realizing it, you will knock down all the evidence that they have. And the Quran is against them. And that is why they threw the Quran away behind their backs and they stuck to some evidences that have no weight. Because anyone who believes in the existence of the magic is calling Allah a God who doesn't tell the truth. And this is not true at all. So an element that must always be carried in the heart of every believer is this. Magic in Hollywood, magic in Las Vegas, where they play an act in front of you, where you pay good money to go and see the magicians. Hey, that's an entertainment magic. Hey, they hide a card here, they pull it from behind your uh, ear. You know it's not behind your ear, but what did the magician do that made it go beyond? And it's trick. Yeah, that is entertaining. But the moment where the magician starts claiming for himself, or herself something that doesn't belong to them then at that moment there we tell them you are a liar and in the world of Muslims today when they speak about magic they give it a proportion that is incredibly contradicting to the Quran look at it this way I go to a magician why uh, because uh, I love that girl and I want to marry her and she's already married so the magician will go away and he will summon some bad jinn and then he's going to say some words funny. I've actually seen what these magicians write. They write in a manner that you don't understand what they say. And it's some, I don't know what, what they get that script from. And when they read it, it reads something extremely funny. It's, it's strange. And then they put it on a piece of paper and they will give you a list of things that you got to do. They, sometimes they tell you you gotta slaughter a dead cat or sometimes they tell you you gotta slaughter a cat they don't ask for that but for example a chicken they say you gotta slaughter a chicken that is six months old and it's dark black and you go where am I gonna get this chicken they go yeah for the success of this spell you gotta do that and people go and search for that chicken buy it for whatever price and they will slaughter and then they will say you take off the blood of the chicken and you put it on this thing and then you go in graveyard at midnight and you dig the grave and you put it there you see how all this is spooky 
But that is exactly what the magician wants. He wants your heart feeble. And then when you do that, you go home and you expect some kind of results. Why? Because you've done everything evil so that the jinn pay attention to you and they give you what you want. And this is a lie. Because if I was a magician, I'd go to the lottery, wait when the, uh, when the jackpot is in the hundreds of millions and summon up the jinn. They give me the formula. I win. I'm rich and end of it. But that is not how the magicians act. So this is one of the problems we're facing today is when Muslims have put their heart and minds in the hands of these charlatans. And instead of believing Allah who says that magic does not exist and the magicians who seek to create a real magic, i.e. creating something out of nothing, cannot succeed, shall not succeed. But the other tricks... It can happen, since the magicians of Musa and the magicians of the Pharaoh did manage to pull a trick and that trick scared Musa. The tricks, they exist, but the real magic, it does not exist. You see, what I'm talking here is about the magic, the kind of magic uh, of the Gandalf, of the Lord of the Rings, where he puts his hand on something and suddenly he heals or he gets evil spirits and things like that. This kind of magic does not exist. And that's why anyone who believes in it is a mushrik, is an associator with Allah. One other thing that I want to talk about here, about this kind of uh, magic and why, and why it's dangerous, why it's dangerous, is simple. Because Allah wants us to always ask of him, of him to help us, to support us, to give us what we need of him. If someone else had that ability to give you what you want, to me, if I ask Allah to help me, and I have a magician that can do the same thing through the jinn, all I have to do is pay a little money and I will certainly get that. Don't you think people would turn away from Allah and go to a magician? They would really would and that is why Allah has made the magician a kafir because he acts like a god on earth yet uh, the abilities of these magici magicians are very uh, restricted in Al-Quran in the Quran the book of Allah Allah spoke about a dangerous issue which the hadith and our scholars affirm they say it existed and Allah says, no, it didn't exist. But as you can see, we know who was followed in these teachings. Allah speaking about Muhammad. The kuffar of Mecca, the people of Mecca, they said that Muhammad is insulted. He is bewitched. That's why he is saying the Quran as he says. It. Allah has said, no, Muhammad is not bewitched. The hadith say that Muhammad has been bewitched between 40 and 6 months, 40 days and 6 months. And the worst thing is, he used to do things and say things, and he doesn't recall or remember any of them. As you can see, Allah says, no, Muhammad never was magic. The hadith says, oh yes, he was magic. And then we have a problem here. Who do we believe we should have gone to the Quran? No, the sheikhs went to the hadith. And when you bring the ayat of the Quran which says Rasulullah is not, they will try to twist and do everything to make sure that the Quran doesn't mean what it means. Allah has reported this idea and he said, وَإِذَا ذَكَرْتَ رَبَّكَ فِي الْقُرْآنِ وَحْدَهُ And whenever you mention your Lord alone, in the Quran, meaning that Allah creates, He's the only one who does this. Allah, la ilaha illallah. What do the kuffar? Wallahu ala adbarihim nufuran. They would turn away and run away from you. Why? Because they believe in so many gods and you believe only in one. So there is a conflict of understanding. And then Allah says, نحن أعلم بما يستمعون به. We know best with what intent when they come to listen to you. They just come listen to you out of curiosity to see if you are different. It just it's not for to seek belief and things like that. And then Allah said, if yes, and whenever they listen to you, and when they go and they are by themselves away from all others, 
What do they say amongst themselves? They say, you just are only listening to somebody who is insulted or bewitched, a magic man. In other words, when Rasulullah is reading the Quran to the people of Mecca, in the streets, in wherever they want, he would read the Quran. They would come to listen to him. But their intent is not to believe. But their intent is worse than that. Is to see how, how of a crazy person he is. And then when the, once they leave that place there, then they are all alone, they talk with each other. And what do they to, to say to each other? You know what? You only are listening to someone who has been, who already is, in, who is under the effect of a magician. He is ensorcelled, he is bewitched, he is witchcraft. This statement is not a praise or a compliment. It's an attack to the most precious thing that a human being can have, their mind. If you go today to a sheikh and tell him, you are bewitched, and I'm a sahur, they will get offended. No, I am not. You say you are, and people get upset if you say that. But to the messenger of Allah, it gets said to him, and it sounds like it's normal. And then, later on in Al-Madinah, the news flew around that the messenger has been bewitched and is bewitched. You know what the people of Mecca would say? You know, you say, yes, we knew this all along. We knew this for years that he is bewitched. And you only discovered that now? And that's why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to refuse this idea and refuse it away, he said, can they contemplate the Qur'an? Don't they read the Qur'an? Or has something come to them that did not come from their forefathers? Yes, the Qur'an is new to them. Or their messenger is unknown to them? That they reject him? Like, oh, okay, we're not going to accept him because he's, we don't know him? Or that they say he is possessed? Allah then said, no, Muhammad is not possessed. In reality, he came to them with the truth, the Qur'an. But the majority of them are hateful to that truth. So as you can see here, if somebody accuses Rasulullah of being bewitched, it means what, <laughs> what has bewitched him is the Qur'an. Because if he didn't say the Qur'an, nobody would say he's bewitched. But to us, Muhammad is bewitched. And worse, he would say and do things and then don't remember them. So please bear in mind, every time somebody says magic exists, and the messenger of Allah has been under the effect of magic, it means he has been possessed by the jinn. Because this Mr. Labid ibn al-Asim, when he did his spell, and the kum and the hair, and, and the, the, the male of the palm tree, and then put them all together, and put them in a well. If I took this combination and did it today, it would deal no results. Nothing would come out of that. There has to be something else on top of that, and that's where the spell comes in. And that's where the spell comes in. So to defend Muhammad, Allah tells them that when Muhammad talks with the Quran, he does not speak out of himself. He does not enunciate. When he talks to you, when he speaks with the Quran, he has no, no control over what he says or when he says it. Muhammad could be talking to the people in Mecca, he could be talking about the nice weather. And they say something, and then Allah says, Qul. And the, one, as the moment Rasulullah, Muhammad starts saying, Qul, they understood that whatever comes after that say is Quran. And that is why Allah, every time he wants to say something, he gets Qul. And, and then he starts uh, talking. Of course, in other parts of the Quran, Allah even explains who taught the Quran to Muhammad. That it's Jibreel who taught him. And all, if you want to read that, go to Surah An-Najm 53. From the beginning to uh, Ayah 12, Allah speaks about who taught uh, Muhammad. I will stop here. And in the next part, inshallah, part 5, we're going to start and speak about the kingdom of Sulaiman. The incredible kingdom of Sulaiman. So inshallah it'll be on part number five. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.